Luke chapter 1, if you look there, and we're going to read in just a minute, uh, beginning in verse 36, Luke chapter 1. Uh, at Christmas time, everybody, it seems, is looking uh, for a miracle. Uh, if something about this time puts in people's hearts the desire to, for something new. Um, just Google a Christmas miracle, uh, or duck, duck, go it, or whatever it is, whatever you use. Um, <laughs> Uh, you'll find lots of results about a Christmas miracle. And um, here Israel is in a spiritually dark time. Uh, God has not spoken for 400 years. it has been silent. No light for 400 years. Hey, what do you do when God is silent? What do you do when God is silent? What do you do when God's not speaking, it seems to you? I urge you, keep seeking Him. Keep seeking Him. You'll find in this story and in others that you'll see in the New Testament that they were, even during that time, they were still seeking the Lord. Keep seeking Him. He'll show up right on time. Yet in the midst of this darkness, it seemed all was lost when nobody could be trusted. God was silent. But get this, God was silent but not sleeping. Listen, the Psalms reminds us that the God of Jacob neither slumbers nor sleeps. Uh, he's, he's, he's not forgotten. He's not looking the other way. He's not on a trip. He, he, he's not silent. Or he's not sleeping, though he may be silent. Psalm 121 uh, reminds us of that. And it might be a little cliche or trite even to say that darkness comes before dawn, but in the beleaguered land that, of Israel at this time, uh, there was a downtrodden people, people that had been beaten up because of their sin. They're in captivity. They're under Roman rule. And uh, during this time, as we come into the Christmas story in Luke, there's a new day dawning. The Lord Jesus is coming. The Son is coming. And the faint hope that was left from Malachi now is being fulfilled in this hour. And so we see, we began this story, this Christmas story last week, uh, Zacharias' and Elizabeth's Christmas story, these Christmas witnesses, we found in verse 6, a righteous couple. They were living righteous, that's what the Bible says about them. They're both righteous before God, walking all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord, blameless. This is a righteous couple, but we find a quiet God. God hasn't spoken. And the news of Israel's deliverer, who would change the world forever, would not come from the palace. Oh, a decree would come from the palace, but it would be about taxation. I guess we're not surprised, right? But that's not a new thing, is it? Yeah. But it comes, this, this, this Israel's deliverer, this news comes in a Jewish house of worship uh, to an aging priest, Zacharias. The Bible says he's well stricken in years. And Zacharias is an interesting name even in the Bible. Uh, Zacharias or Zechariah. Uh, it was a common name. Even one of the Old Testament books is, is named that after uh, uh, Zechariah. And, of course, there's multiple Zechariahs in the Bible. Um, and I mentioned this last week. It's not a coincidence that the Lord Jesus, after this 400 years of silence, God's first words to His people in 400 years would come to a man whose name means the Lord has remembered. The Lord has remembered. And God, the God who remembered them after 400 years in bondage in Egypt, has remembered them now, he would, he, he would rescue them now from their sins. Remember, Jesus didn't come just to be born in a manger and, and make a, a, a pretty uh, manger scene. The Bible says, Thou shalt call His name Jesus. Why? For He shall save His people from their sins. And praise God that God came for all people, the Bible says. We read that in the Christmas story, that this is good news for all people. That's including you and me. And so the Lord had remembered. It's not simply that God didn't forget. It's that when you find in the God's Word it says God remembered, like God remembered Noah. God didn't forget Noah was in the ark. When God remembered, it means when God says that He's going to act. And of course, that's what He does. He acts. And God was not only about to act on a national level on behalf of Zacharias and Elizabeth's people, but He's going to act here, we see, we began to see last week, in a personal way on a personal level, in a personal way. Aren't you glad our God's a personal God? He doesn't just bless a county or a state or a country or bless even a family. He works in individuals. 
Look, your dad, your mom, they can be going away from God, and you can still walk with God. Listen, uh, your spouse can be doing the wrong thing going away from God, and you can still walk with God. And you can still have God's blessing. And it doesn't matter. You say, well, you don't know what they did. It doesn't matter what they did. If you don't walk with God or won't walk with God, you won't have God's blessing. God is an individual, personal Savior. It doesn't matter if your family name is Hitler or your family name is, is Washington or something. It doesn't matter if it's a family name that people would say, oh, wow, what a... or if it's something that is a bad connotation. God loves individuals. He works in individual lives. And those that will seek Him, God will work. The Bible still says, draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. Don't you love that? Well, everyone, all my friends, it doesn't matter what all your friends are doing. If you will go after the Lord, if you'll seek Him, He will respond to you. That's the kind of God we have. And so He is working a personal way, and you can imagine their pain. Their pain was not just grounded in the brokenness around them of their nation. Their pain was very personal. They, they were dealing with a private anger. The Bible says about them that we learned last week, they have no child. They have no child. And Elizabeth, like a long line of godly women in the story of God, was unable to bear a child. And in any age, to suffer the infertility, not being able to have children is hard, and can be cruel. But especially in this day and hour, in this time, because it was the ability to conceive, especially among the Jews, was... was looked at as God's divine favor or God's blessing. And if you could not uh, have children, then that was looked down upon as if a reproach. Even the Bible says that in this story. If you notice Luke 1, verse 25, when Elizabeth says after she conceived, verse 24, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked to me to take away my reproach among men. And so it was. this has been something that had hurt all these years. And and I, I think that uh, at this point in their lives, they were, the Bible says, well stricken in years. And many believe that means they were past 80. But they had given up hope <laughs> of having children, you know. They'd resigned themselves to that fate. Uh, never would they hear the soft whisper of a child's first words. Or uh, never would they have the privilege of walking their son or daughter in, uh, to the temple. Or uh, never would they have the privilege of sitting down with their children and telling them, let me tell you the story of Israel and what God did, and how He's blessed our people, and how He wanted to work through our people to show the whole world that there is a God in Israel, and God loves us. He's a great God. And it's interesting, there's a kind of a theme in Scripture of God visiting the barren. Who can forget the despair of Sarah? Couldn't have a baby, and Abraham and Sarah, 100, and her at 90, had Isaac, or... Rebecca or Rachel and in the line of Abraham who all had their authentic pleas for children and then uh, the guttural cries of Hannah in the temple and God gave her Samuel and opened her womb or, or how about even uh, David's first wife, Michael there, who she couldn't have any uh, children. And Luke carefully mentions here and he wants to point out, I think it's good to see in, in verses 6, 7, and 8, the Bible says, and they were both righteous before God, walking all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless, in verse 7, and they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both now well stricken in years. I think God carefully mentions those things together, the righteousness of Zacharias and Elizabeth, along with their infertility, letting us know that the reason they couldn't have children was not a result of sin. It wasn't because of, of that type of thing. Because like in our day, it was in their day, that many people will look at something going bad in someone's life and say that's a result of sin. That can be. But we're not always knowing the real truth of why God's doing something. You remember even the disciples. Here's someone lame and the disciple says, was it his sin or his parents' sin? Maybe it was someone blind, but someone that had some problem. And Jesus said, neither, but that the glory of God might be shown through healing. And so it's not always, and we have to be very careful about that, but certainly in their day it was that way. Then, like now, there was a, there's a temptation to use prosperity as a measuring stick for devotion, as if God is some type of uh, cosmic scorekeeper, and who has the most faith gets a blessing. And favor is based on that. 
In every age, there's that temptation. And Job, remember, was suffering loss. And what did his friends come and think? You're, you're some sin in your life. There's something you've done wrong. Uh, he, lost, he lost his children, his prosperity, his health. He, he's tormented with boils and everything from his head to his toe, kind of in that thin space between life and death. I mean, he was in bad shape. Looked awful. His skin turning, uh, you know, dark and just, I mean, he looked, looked like death, I imagine. His so-called friends, remember, whispered in his ear, perhaps it's because of your lack of faith in some area. Of course, we know it was the exact opposite. It was the Lord saying, look at my servant, who, what type of man he is. But Job 4, 7, and 8 says, remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent. Or where were the righteous cut off, even as I have seen that the, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. And that's true, but it's not always that way. It's kind of stuff they muse. This all has to be, it has to happen to bad people. But like Job's friend, friends, anyone today who ties faith directly to physical flourishing is wrong. Sometimes it's the wicked that seem like everything's going great. Read, read Psalm 73. It seems like the wicked is flourishing, the wicked is prospering. And what he's saying in Psalm 73, then I went to the house of God and saw their end. The judgment is coming. God will deal with sin. See, in a broken world, very bad things often happen to very good people. What did Job do? Job was faithful. He kept seeking God. What did he say? The Bible says, he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And what did he do? He went to the house of God and worshiped like he had before. He kept seeking God. Here's Zacharias and Elizabeth, all these years, no child. What did they do? Were they bitter against God? No, they were faithful. That's what the Bible says in verse 6. Righteous, obedient to God all these years. Blameless, he says at the end of verse 6. Just faithful. And yet God allowed them to suffer. Why? Well, it was, would be for their good and for His glory. Now, let me read this to you. An evangelist shared this with me this week. I thought it was very good. Talking about Mary. We read this in the Sunday School Hour about her being highly favored among women. She was highly favored, but was almost put away by the man she loved the most. Highly favored, but she was rejected by every person in Bethlehem. Highly favored, but she laid on the dirt floor of a barn and gave birth to a baby she carried nine months. Highly favored, but in the middle of the night they had to leave all she knew had to leave all she knew and move to a strange town because God said so. Favor never looks like favor at first. Favor sometimes takes you through frustration, failure, and fear. You want to be favored of God? It may be in the darkest night or deepest valley, but there in that place where no one sees you, and you feel like no one understands, whisper to yourself, this is only the beginning, not the end. This will turn out for my good and His glory. This is because I'm favored. You know, the Bible says about Psalm 23, for those of us who the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want, but even when the Lord's your shepherd, you'll go through the valley of the shadow of death. But the Bible says, even in that valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? For thou art. I rod and thy staff, they come for me. And so God is with us, so even though we're favored, and we are, if you know the Lord is your Savior, the Bible says you're a holy priesthood, a royal nation. You are someone that are favored of God. You're the children of the King of kings and Lord of lords. But it may not always look that way, but it's not the end. It's just the beginning. For the child of God is going to be better and greater until we're in heaven with Him for all eternity. What a God we have. Here is a devout couple who, like many children of Abraham, under the old covenant, they believed God's promises, and the Bible says their faith was counted to them as righteousness. Galatians 2 talks about that. And today you might be here and say, Pastor, all I'm hearing from God is silence. It seems like all I'm hearing is silence. This is where Zacharias and Elizabeth was. And like Zacharias and Elizabeth, you're faithful. You earnestly believe God, but all you hear in your suffering, it seems, is silence. No, no cure.
cure for your illness. Uh, no answer yet for your prayer. No, no uh, positive pregnancy test, if you will. As th- that's what they were praying for. Uh, no new job offers. I don't know what it might be. But from this story, you can be encouraged. The same God who remembered His people in Egypt and remembered Zacharias, His people here in Judea, and remembered His people on the cross as He suffered and died for us, He remembers you. He's at work in your life. God's not intimidated by the things that threaten you. God is working on your behalf for your good to bring good and to achieve glory even from pain, even from heartache, even from things that look like it hurts. And it does hurt. Luke chapter 1, we pick up the story where we were last time. Let's begin in verse 36. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth. This is the angel speaking to Mary about she's going to have, of course, the Lord Jesus. Behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she also hath conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. Verse 37, you see it? Let's read this verse together. Ready? For with God nothing shall be impossible. Well, that's not the message, but that would carry you through all of life. You you just remember that. For with God, it doesn't matter how it looks, for with God nothing should be impossible. And Mary said, oh, I love the faith of Mary. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. She's saying, behold the servant girl of the Lord. Behold, your servant, Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Can I encourage you when God speaks to you, don't bargain with him. Don't try to have it, Lord, okay, that's fine, but can we throw in a few things here? Can we uh, put in some extra favors here? No, just be it unto me according to your word. God knows the way that's best. God has it already worked in your favor. Uh, God already has it worked out for your best. Don't try to mess with the plan it's not going to get better you might think it does but god knows better than you and she says be it unto me according to thy word i love it verse 39 and mary rose in those days and went to the hill country with haste into a city of judah and entered into the house of zacharias and saluted elizabeth and it came to pass that when elizabeth heard the salutation of mary the babe leaped in her womb and elizabeth was filled with the holy ghost now that's interesting who was already filled with the holy ghost Verse 15, for he should be great in the sight of the Lord. Talking about John the Baptist. And shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he should be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. So this babe inside her is already filled with the Holy Ghost. And Elizabeth now here is filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice. Isn't it interesting when people are filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Ghost, they speak and give witness of their God. They speak and give the gospel <laughs> loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Oh, I love her faith. Love her faith. And so we're going to continue reading verse 46. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him. From generation to generation he has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things. The rich he has sent empty away. He hath hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. We've been looking at that in Genesis 12, haven't we? And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. So we see here where Zacharias and Elizabeth's story intersects with the Lord Jesus. And Mary, Jesus stays in their house three months while he's still in his mother's womb there. And so last week, I want to call your attention to what we looked at last time, the t- same title, Zacharias and Elizabeth's Christmas story. A Christmas miracle. You know, miracles 
are all around when the Lord's at work. That, that's our supernatural God. He always operates in the supernatural. And uh, remember, uh, an angel that appeared and, and he tells him, even though you are well stricken in age, you're going to have this baby, Zacharias. All these miracles. So today I want to call, if you will, Zacharias and Elizabeth to the witness stand to give their Christmas witness and continue their story about Christmas. Tell the Christmas miracle that they saw. Let's pray. Father, help us now as we look at your word. Oh, teach us these next few minutes these two truths that you have here. And Father, would you open our eyes to behold wondrous things of thy law. Father, I thank you that as we see your truth and obey and believe, it brings joy. Oh, it increases our faith. And I pray that everyone here would believe your word and you flood their heart with joy. I pray if there's a lost person here that they'd be saved. Father, they wouldn't leave here wondering if they're going to heaven, hoping they're going to heaven, thinking they might go to heaven, but they would receive you as their Savior and settle it for all, receive everlasting life, be born again, and know that you live in them, and you promise once you come in, you'll never leave us or forsake us. Oh, we praise you for that. Speak now, we pray. We have ears to hear, Lord. Help us to listen to what you have to say in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at... A supernatural Christmas, that was kind of the big point number one over this. Supernatural Christian, and under that we looked last week at two things. Number one, unbelievable. Unbelievable. And supernatural always is unbelievable. It's kind of in the definition, right? Supernatural stuff is just unbelievable. We would say in our day, it'll blow your mind, right? Uh, a, a mind grenade or however you want to talk about it. Number two was unbelievable, if we're not careful, turns into unbelief. And that's what we see in Zacharias. Unbelievable turns into unbelief. This is where the Christian must factor in God. The world doesn't factor God into things. Everything has to work out on paper. Everything's about the money. Everything's dollars and cents. Everything's about uh, how it's going to appear in the public or in the news cycle. Uh, they don't factor God in or God working at all. But for the Christian, we're to factor God in. We are to believe God. And I asked you last week, do you believe God? Instead of believing God, Zacharias says, can you imagine this, the humor of God? There's an angel. He's praying. The Bible says the angel shows up and says, your prayer is heard. You're going to have a child. And he's going to be great. And he gives all this about Zac uh, who, who John the Baptist is going to be. And Zacharias says to this angel, how shall I know that this is true? <laughs> I want a sign, he says. How about an angel appear? Right? I mean, how about that as a sign? And so that's what Gabriel says. I'm Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. <laughs> what other sign do you need? But because you want a sign, because you're unbelief, he says in verse 20, you won't be able to speak. You'll be dumb until this all comes to pass. So the unbelievable turned into unbelief. But oh, here we see two people of faith. We see... Mary here, we see Elizabeth. We're looking at Elizabeth's story, and of course Mary intersects here with this story. And so number three today, believing brings joy. Believing brings joy. Brings joy. Here, unbelief, uh, it caused loss. It cost. He couldn't talk. He couldn't come out and say what God had done. When you believe, it brings joy. We already read it, but notice in uh, verse 44. For lo... As soon as the voice of salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Not only that, uh, verse 47, uh, verse 46, Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. Oh, when you believe God, it brings joy. Believing brings joy. Six months after Elizabeth's expecting this miracle child in their old age, who promised to be the forerunner of the highest, the prophet of the highest. I love that phrase. Look at verse 76. It tells you that. And thou, he's talking now to Zacharias, uh, is talking here, actually Zacharias is talking to the child. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. Thou shalt go before the face of the Lord and prepare his way. And he, while she's expecting the prophet of the highest, here comes Mary, who is bearing the king of the highest, or the son of the highest, verse 32 tells you that. He should be great and should be called the son of the highest. 
And, of course, he was conceived by the power of the highest. Look at verse 35. The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest overshadowed thee. Isn't that amazing? See that phrase three times in that chapter, the prophet of the highest, the son of the highest, the power of the highest. Think how God strengthened their faith as they believed God. And our God always operates in the realm of the supernatural. Uh, by the way, did you notice there in verse 41 and verse 45 that this developing child, he's six months old, still in the womb, but notice it had a life of its own. Look at verse 41. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the citation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Verse 45, and, uh, or verse 44, excuse me. For lo, as soon as the, of cit- thy citation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Now think about that. The developing child, six months old in the womb, but it has a life of its own. Bam, abortion is settled by the word of God. Look at verse 15. For he should be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he should be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from, what? His mother's womb. This is not just tissue that's going to grow in the mother's body. This is a life. This is an identity. This is a person. This is someone who has a purpose given by God from his mother's womb. Do you understand that every baby ever born, every baby ever conceived, I should say, had a purpose given by God. From the mother's womb, there was a purpose. The moment of conception before dad and mom knew they had a baby, God had a purpose for that baby. So that's how great our God is. See, we're telling children in school that you come from an animal and just live your life however because it's just random chance that you're even here. So no wonder they don't see any problem with killing their baby. But boy, when we tell them God made you, you're fearfully and wonderfully made, and God has a special plan and purpose for your life. Think of that. Then when they have a child and they conceive, they know this is something that God's given this child a purpose, a plan. This is something that God has given life. See, it's, it's something far beyond just some tissue. No, this is a person, praise the Lord, who does all things well, Mary here has experienced something that coincided very closely to what Zacharias had experienced. She saw an angel. Now, you, you know how it is. If someone showed up today and started telling you they saw an angel, you'd be like, hmm, what did you eat last night before you went to bed? I mean, that would be our natural thing. We would be a little bit suspect of that. But Zacharias, he had seen an angel too. So when Mary said she saw an angel, he had already done the unbelief. He already went down that road. And he knew he had seen an angel. And so Mary starts talking about this angel. Think now. He was in Elizabeth. They're having a child. And what was that child supposed to be? The forerunner. The forerunner. Hey, if you have a forerunner to the Messiah, it's natural to think that what's coming the Messiah. You have a forerunner to the king, the king's coming, right? And so if, if Mary's child is to be the Messiah, which is supposed to be, that makes total sense. Hey, we've got a forerunner coming. He's going to announce. He's going to prepare the way of the Lord. That means the Lord's coming. And he's the forerunner for it. And so Zacharias, he's done with doubting. He's done with unbelief. Hallelujah. And him and, him and uh, Elizabeth now are believing. And oh, it brings such joy. You imagine the joy in that house. All these years they've been praying for a baby, and not only is is they have the promise, but she's six months along, and you know, ladies, at six months, it's not just you think you're having a baby, you know you're having a baby, right? And everyone else can see you and know you're having a baby, and and the baby's moving and kicking and all those type of things, and and, and the excitement that that brought in that home, and then Mary comes and says, uh, and, and talks about how she, the cousin here, John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins, see. And this cousin, Mary, is having, of course, the Lord Jesus. She's bringing forth what God sent for. So believing brings joy. Number four, uh, in this, under this, about a supernatural Christmas, believing brings faith. Supernatural Christmas. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, we see, turns into unbelief. 
But then we see these that believe. Believing brings joy. And then believing brings faith. I love how Elizabeth emphasized Mary's faith. Look at verse 45. And blessed is she, this is Elizabeth speaking, and blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which are told her from the Lord. Now think about this. Zacharias came home and he said, listen, Elizabeth, we're going to have a baby. And you know, you, she probably thought what you would have thought. What Sarah thought when Abraham even heard from the angel, even heard from the Lord himself saying, you're going to have a baby in your old age. And she laughed, remember? Am I going to have pleasure in my old age? I mean, she laughed. And yet, Isaac was born. And here, Elizabeth, whether she believed or not, we, we, it looks like she did believe. But hey, sure enough, by now her faith had become sight. Six months along. She, she's having this baby. Not only that, the baby's leaping in her womb. I mean, she knows. This is, she's having a baby. And so she says to Mary, Mary's just got this word. She just got this word, and when, when she did, in verse 39, it said, after the angel left, and she said, Be it unto me according to thy word. Verse 39, Mary arose in those days and went to the hill country with haste into a city of Judah. So this is just days removed from this announcement. She doesn't have any showing yet. Uh, nothing's, nothing's happened as far as she knows. Um, she's, obviously, this has nothing to do with a man. This is a virgin-born son. And she says, let me tell you, what the angel said to you is true. Hey, and Mary had believed it, but she's encouraging her faith. You see that in verse 45? And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which are told her from the Lord. Boy, I love when older Christians, meaning those that have walked a little while on this journey with Jesus, say to a younger Christian, listen, everything God's promised you is going to happen. What the Bible says is true, and what God says is going to happen, you can count on it, you can believe it, there will be a performance of that which God has promised. And that's what, that's what Elizabeth's saying here. I mean, these people have been, I mean, Mary's young. We don't know how old, many, some believe maybe even as young as a teenager. We don't know that. But we know Elizabeth's well stricken in years. And, and they have walked with God all their life. They've been righteous and blameless, the Bible said in verse 6. We've already looked at that. And now this promise, I'm sure was unbelievable when she heard it, but she believed it. And sure enough, six months along, she knows it's happening. And she says to Mary, I want to encourage you. What the angel has said, what God has promised, it's, there's going to be performance. God will perform it. I want to tell you this morning, what God has done in the lives of millions of people that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and been saved, if you're here between believing and unbelieving, if you're here between making a decision for God, you've not yet been born again, you've not yet received Christ your Savior, I want to tell you, there's lots of people in this room that would love to tell you, if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. Hey, what you've believed on, there will be a performance of that. And if you'll put your faith and trust in Christ today, He will do what He said He'll do. And He'll come into your life. Oh, praise the Lord for that. But not only that, for you that are young believers, and we have some here, uh, you are new. Hey, listen, there's other people that have been here, and I want to be one of them to say, as you obey God, as you follow God, let me tell you, on the path of obedience, you'll find blessing. God will meet you there. It doesn't mean there won't be any hard times, but God will be there. God will go through it with you, and there will be a performance of what God has promised. He'll never leave you or forsake you. That shepherd, in that, even in the valley of the shadow of death, you'll find he's there, his presence is there, and he'll help you and encourage you and bring you through the valley of the shadow of death. You don't go there to stay, you're going to go through it. Praise God for that. Hallelujah. And that's what Elizabeth is doing here for Mary. I think there's going to be some in heaven we don't have, know their name or we have just their name in a small little snippet in the Bible that are going to be big in the sight of God because there were people that encouraged great people. Uh, you know, you go through some of the people on the wall out here in the hallways and, you know, a D.L. Moody that had a Sunday school teacher that had a heart for him and went after him. D.L. Moody, people know that, but no one hardly knows the name of the Sunday school teacher. You know, Mr. Kimball. I mean, there's, there's lots of people like that. I heard Dr. Lee Robertson, Dr. Lee Robertson pastored church over 10,000 in Sunday school, and I heard him say about his Sunday school teacher that led him to Christ. And she was a, a lady that, that taught boys, uh, Sunday school, just junior boys. Daisy Hawes, he would talk about Daisy Hawes. Well, no one in the world knows who Daisy Hawes is. But in heaven, she led 
Dogley Robertson to Christ, who had, you know, Tessie Temple University and Highland Park Baptist Church there in Chattanooga, and all that God did. Uh, he's been in heaven now for a number of years. But think about that. There's going to be people like, Zach, like Elizabeth here that encourage. Everyone knows who Mary is. I mean, everyone in the whole world has heard of, even if they're not believers, they've heard of uh, this Mary that gave birth, brought forth what God sent forth, the Lord Jesus Christ. But all oh, Elizabeth here encourages her. See, believing brings faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Do you know the Lord Jesus is your Savior? Just the fact that God is offering salvation is His grace, but have you believed by faith? And because Mary believed the Word of God, she experienced the power of God. Well, think how their faith in God encouraged each other even. And by the way, that's one thing church does. As we assemble, the Bible says, not forsaking the assembly yourselves together as a matter of some is, but what? Exhorting one another. See, when you come together, well, you may be having a rough time, hard time, but someone come beside you and say, let me tell you, the thing I've been praying for, God came through. Let me tell you, in the past, God's come through. And I, hey, you know he's come through for you in the past, and he's going to come through again. There's going to be a performance of what he's done. And blessed, verse 45, and blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And contrast that with verse 20. Zacharias said, Behold, here's the angel telling him, Thou shalt be dumb and not be able to speak until the day that these things should be performed. Because he didn't believe it. Verse, verse 20. Because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. Hey, these things shall be performed, but you're not going to be able to talk about it and you won't be able to speak because you didn't believe that they're going to be performed. But here in verse 45, here's someone that believed it was going to be performed and she's been encouraged in her faith. What the Lord says is going to happen. It's going to come to pass. That's what discipleship does, by the way, too. Someone that is growing in the faith, discipling someone else, iron sharpening iron, encouraging that person, hey, God will do what he's promised. Oh, I love that. As we conclude this morning, Elizabeth had faith while her husband was Zacharias. He didn't. Like I said earlier, friend, just because your husband doesn't believe doesn't mean you can't. Just because your husband's not doing right and want one with God doesn't mean you can't do right and want with God. Or just because your wife's not doing it doesn't mean you can't. Or just because your children aren't. Or just because your parents aren't. Or just because, hey, you can do right and walk with God. And we see that here. And you can encourage other to do right and walk with God. She believed God. Now she encourages Mary. Elizabeth had walked with God many years. She assured her there would be a performance of what God revealed. Because Mary believed the Word of God, she experienced the power of God. God was at work. All along, He had worked all the details out. They just needed to believe what God said was going to come to pass. The only priest that would believe was Zacharias. So God had allowed him to see an angel, and so God puts Mary right there. Not only did Zacharias believe her, but he was the very one that could declare her innocent, a priest. Here's an unmarried woman without, without a husband here. With child, she could be stoned. What a Savior who does all things well. Well, let's rejoice in God's gift. Because of people of great faith and obedience like Mary, we're reaping the blessings of that faith. And, and hallelujah, some of you are like, I don't, I'm not even thinking about having a baby. And some of you will say, we're, 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 we're well stricken in years and, and we're not looking for a miracle baby. <laughs> but God's not asking you to have a baby. He is asking you, though, to tell someone about what God has done. Your faith, believing, encouraging someone else's faith to believe. He came to die. Tell someone on Calvary and what he's done in your heart. That risen Lord that rose from the grave 2,000 years ago, if you're saved, you know he's risen in your heart. And he lives in your heart. And he's alive. And you need to tell someone about it. That's what the Lord would have you do. Will you go and tell? Would you bow your head with me in prayer?